President Marcos signs Executive Order 57 to beef up the country's maritime security after the latest run-in with the Chinese Coast Guard. Beijing says Philippine policies have no impact on their claims. Mountain barangays in Cebu City are placed under a state of calamity due to the effects of El Nino. Classes in several provinces were also suspended due to dangerous heat index levels. And after passing the measure on economic charter change in record time, House lawmakers slam polling firm Pulse Asia for supposedly painting Chacha in a bad light in a recent survey. Welcome to the show. I'm Regina Lay. I'm Gretchen Hall. And I'm Sean Yao. Well, if you haven't been following the news during the long Easter break, we all thought it was going to be quiet, <laughs> but a lot has happened, so let's try to catch you up. First things first. For starters, we now have Executive Order Number 57, which aims to bolster the country's maritime security in the face of, quote-unquote, open, unabating, illegal and coercive attacks by China. This EO released on Sunday seeks to strengthen the Philippines' maritime security and maritime domain awareness. It covers the country's oceans, seas, and other bodies of water, as well as all maritime-related activities, infrastructure, people, cargo, and vessels. It also aims to protect and conserve the Philippines' maritime assets, maritime practices, territorial activities, and coastal peace and order. To achieve that, EO number 57 renamed and reorganized the National Coast Watch Council, or NCWC, into what will now be called the National Maritime Council, or NMC. This will be chaired by the Executive Secretary, a post currently held by Lucas Bersamin. Other members include the heads of agencies like the Defense, Environment, and Foreign Affairs Departments. The Council is in charge of formulating strategies to ensure an effective governance framework for the country's maritime security and domain awareness. The National Task Force for the West Philippine Sea will be an attached agency of the NMC. And the task force will receive policy guidance from the President through the Council. Pinalakas din yung kanyang powers and functions. No? Mm. Ibig sabihin, uh, yung kabu ang ng buong Pilipinas na po ngayon ang covered niya. I think uh, the president's statements was very clear. Mm -hmm. No, we will not be deterred. No, uh, tayo ay handa na gawin ng lahat para ipaglaban yung atin din naman. Mm -hmm. No, yung ating mga maritime rights and in, and entitlements in the West Philippine Sea and in other parts of the archipelago. That is why the president has strengthened the maritime domain awareness and maritime security across the entire Philippines. Mm -hmm. Hindi na lang in the West Philippines. Beijing reacted almost immediately to this EO and didn't stray far from their usual script. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenbin says their sovereignty and maritime rights in the disputed waters will not be affected by Philippine policies. Listen into this. No matter what policies the Philippines introduces, it will not affect China's territorial sovereignty and maritime rights and interests. We hope that the Philippine side will honor its commitments and abide by the relevant understanding and consensus reached between China and the Philippines, abide by the provisions of the joint declaration of the parties in the South China Sea signed by China and ASEAN countries, and stop infringement and provocation. Stop instigating foreign forces to intervene in South China Sea affairs and return to the right track of properly managing the situation through negotiation and consultation. We should shoulder our due responsibilities for maintaining peace and stability in the South China Sea. Well, from the National Coast Watch Council, it is now the National Maritime Council. So, and that the coast lang ngayon, mm. it's, it's uh, the whole mm. Philippines and maritime affairs, maritime yeah. domain. The and it's uh, uh, composed of a group of uh, some of the most important agencies. Mm -hmm. So, in the again, country. another interagency uh, task force. Oh, nga, no, it's oh, oh, another interagency. IETF. Uh, Actually, no tinitig ko COVID, yung ano, it's uh, tinitig nan ko yung National Security. Coast Watch Council. Kasama naman yung mga DA, DOE, DNR. Ang nadagdag lang dito, NSA, yung NICA, yung DOTR, at yung OSG. Mm. So basically, halos lahat na Tapos yung, yung uh, support agencies, yung PIDEA, National Mapping and Resource Info Authority, Philippine Space Agency, and the UP Institute of Maritime Affairs. Yun yung nadagdag naman sa support mm, agency. Okay, so, so, so beefing up on the research side of yes. things. Yes. 
Okay. So but, basically, lahat na uh, This EO has been met with both uh, what we call cheers and jeers. So there's people on the pro side and the against side. On the pro side, you have retired senior associate justice Antonio Carpio. Earlier today, he spoke at a press con hosted by the National Youth Movement for the West Philippine Sea, which is urging the government to file another arbitration case against China. Uh, they said that there's been uh, massive environmental damage in the disputed waters. But listen to what Justice Carpio had to say. Well, uh, I'm in favor of that because uh, that will streamline and harmonize all our efforts. No? Uh, that will uh, we'll be putting our act together. But uh, dapat ginawa ito noong pa. Like for example, uh, when we filed the arbitration at the Hague, uh, and we needed data, hirap na hirap kami to get saan pa kukunin ito. There was no central authority where you can get the data. The DOJ already announced that uh, they are preparing to file a damage case uh, against China before UNCLOS for the destruction of the marine environment in Skoda Shoal and Brussels Reef. All we are doing is to encourage the government to continue with that. So as Regina said, not everyone uh, was for this, or there is also a con side or an against side. One of those is uh, Senator Amy Marcos, who is not so pleased with this EO57. Mm, going up against the brother again. Mm. Hot and heavy. Okay, I'm going to quote uh, Senator Amy. This is what she said. Emotion rather than reason has prevailed in our maritime conflict with China and is leading us down a dangerous path that will cost us more than just Filipino pride. Section 7 of the newly signed EO57 welcomes many a Trojan horse of foreign interference through donations, contributions, grants, bequests or gifts from domestic and foreign sources that the National Maritime Center has been authorized to accept. Such largesse has been the fuel to never-ending conflict as we still see in the Ukraine and Gaza. And also today, Senate Majority Leader Joel Villanueva, of course, colleague of Senator Amy Marcos, he filed Resolution 980, which strongly condemns the CCG or Chinese Coast Guard and maritime militias, quote, unprovoked aggression and continued harassment. Last year, we also know that uh, Justice Secretary uh, Boeing Rimulia said they are consulting legal experts on possible legal actions at the International Tribunal. I, we still don't have clarity at this point what, what that means, whether that's following uh, th up or following through on the 2016 case. Uh, but yeah, we're just going by what he said. Well, it wasn't just the weather that was hot over the Holy <laughs> Week. Know. Apparently, social media as well, <laughs> including about this supposed gentleman's agreement. Retired Justice Carpio talked about that uh, supposed gentleman's agreement between former President Duterte and Chinese President Xi Jinping. He said this agreement was a trap set up by China. China wants the BRP chairman to just collapse. Now, BRP Sierra Madre uh, is hardly, is very weakly defended. China could easily seize BRP Sierra Madre, but they are not doing it because we carry Sierra Madre in a roster of active ships. If China will attack it, that is an armed attack on a public vessel of the Philippines, we can invoke the treaty. Alam ng China the consequence. Kaya iniintay lang ng China lulubog yung Beatrice Sierra Madre. So the aim of China is hindi dapat i-repair para lulubog na. Pumayag si Duterte. Hindi na namin i-repair. That means we fell into the trap of China. There is, there's certainly a lot of noise about this supposed gentleman's agreement today and it got even noisier today because some former uh, spokesman, uh, Tony Salpanello, mm -hmm. said on SMNI that he spoke to the former president twice during the Holy Week and that there was no agreement whatsoever though. Oh, ito yung sinabi niya, babasahin ko, no? Kung sino mang nagkakalat ng gentleman's agreement, ng sisinungaling, baka gusto lang ng publicidad sa sarili niya. So that's what former uh, uh, legal counsel of President Duterte mm. said. Oh yeah, sorry, legal mm. counsel, not mm. spokesman. But he was spokesman also a spokesman. Role, okay. At a very oh, short yeah. stint. For Correct. very short yeah, stint. For yeah. very short stint. So we don't know which is which. But in, in, the, in all probability, mm -hmm. they are 
responding to different questions because there are two big questions at the heart of this issue. Mm -hmm. Number one, who promised to tow away the BRP share of Madrid to begin with? And number two, uh, was there ever really a uh, promise to not do any repairs on the BRP share of So that's Well, what. you know, I've been uh, spokes, uh, spokesperson Harry Roque, na yung status quo walang gagalaw, mm. walang dadal hit too big at ano lang pagkain lang ang mm. pwedeng dalhin doon. So magkaiba no yun na issue doon sa Iba yun supposed sa towing, to, mm. towing oh, away na magaganap correct. na up to now, uh, I mean, this witch hunt has been going on for months now. Yeah. Nobody has even able to trace no, kung sino Actually, pa years, 10 years, di ba? We were talking <laughs> about on Friday. Uh, Thanks I mean, to our archaeologist the, here I, na nag ten, 10 years ago, China was already accusing us of lying, saying that we promised to tow it away, but we never did. So apparently, was there like, was also an ASEAN agreement on that, mm. uh, that uh, no more expansions. So mm. I, I, I'm wondering if that was a fruit of that conversation in the ASEAN. Under the Declaration the 2014 of article. Oh, the OC. Oh, oh. Oh. Uh, one thing we know for sure today is that the president's rhetoric on China has hardened after the national security class, class, cluster met last <laughs> week. Uh, because when he was in Melbourne, when Marcus was in Melbourne just in early March, he gave an interview to ABC. Yes, that same interview that went viral because he... Uh, you know, kind of laughed off the question about corruption. Anyway, in that interview, he said, the ongoing attempt is always to try and lower the temperature down when the rhetoric is up. And then also in November last year at the APEC summit in San Francisco, Marcus said he will meet with Xi Jinping on the sidelines of that summit to quote unquote, get the view of the Chinese president on what we can do to bring down the temperature to not escalate the situation in the West Philippine Sea. But yun nga, again, during the Holy Week break, mm -hmm. he issued a statement himself saying, you know, uh, in a nutshell, enough is enough. Um, we have to do something. Uh, 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 propose, he's proposing measures against China's quote unquote countermeasures. Countermeasures, yes, counter open, unabating, illegal, coercive attacks. Those are his words. So, talagang, something's changed. Great. Right. Okay, uh, let's try to get more insights on this new executive order. Uh, first guest uh, with us tonight is security analyst Chester Cabalza. Chester, good evening. How are you? Hi, good evening, Regina and Gretchen uh, and Sean. Uh, thanks for having me again in your program. I'm gathering you didn't have a very uh, peaceful and relaxed Holy <laughs> Week break. <laughs> huh? Busy, busy, I'm sure. I think. So let's... Yes, yes. <laughs> I know, yeah. This morning, uh, I, uh, I had a lot of uh, interviews uh, from the media uh, about this uh, PO57. I can imagine. So let's get into it. What did you think? Well, of course, uh, this uh, what differs to the... NW uh, post, uh, post watch uh, council to the maritime uh, security council here. I think uh, I, uh, what is uh, more important here in the EO 57 is the proclamation where our president uh, is claiming for the fundamental rights uh, to live in peace and uh, freedom. And of course, uh, he wanted uh, Philippines to be free from uh, fear and uh, fear from uh, violence and threat. I think that's the, the core of the EO57 uh, because of the series of um, um, tirades and, of course, uh, water cannon coming from uh, from China. And the, if you try to look at it, uh, it's just an expansion of the previous uh, executive order that was signed by uh, then uh, President uh, Benigno Aquino in 2011 uh, when uh, he established the uh, National Coast Watch uh, uh, Council. Uh, and then after that, uh, we saw the 2012 uh, Scarborough show standoff. And now we are here in another um, series of standoff um, in, in Ayun Shoal. So I think uh, this is, um, uh, it, it, it proves also this, the, the side of the Philippines where we look at the uh, legalist approach of the Philippines, because this is the strength of the Philippines, you know, of our country. Uh, 2016, we have the arbitration uh, award. Uh, which uh, uh, even up to now, China disregards it, but uh, the international community um, praises uh, uh, the Philippines uh, for its uh, maritime rules based norms. Uh, this time around, we are trying to um, fix our own domestic laws in order for us to safeguard our own uh, maritime domains. So the executive order number um, 57 will help us to, uh, in a way, look at the uh, uh, different parameters on consultation, research, administration, technical, and uh, technical services 
of these uh, new capsules. Right. Chester, um, uh, just to get your thoughts on this, uh, you're saying basically that EO57 is something that we do need in, in the face of what we're experiencing in the South China Sea slash West Philippine Sea. My question mm. is, do you think that this has been a long time coming or was this in reaction to the recent spate of uh, you know, increased harassment, etc., in the disputed waters? Uh, possibly, uh, this is a clear reaction to the um, series of uh, violence uh, that uh, China uh, Coast Guard has done to our Philippine Coast Guard. But uh, in my understanding, uh, perhaps this is the, the, the remedy of our government. Because even up to now, we still do not have the maritime zones and the archipelagic sea lanes. Mm -hmm. the, on the um, domestic law that would help us uh, safeguard our maritime domains would be the baseline laws that we have. So remember, um, in our uh, past conversations before, uh, three important laws uh, should uh, prevail uh, in our uh, um, in, in our uh, strategic culture. Uh, namely, you should have the baseline laws, and then of course the Maritime Zones Act and the uh, archipelagic sea lanes. Uh, the two uh, other uh, laws are still proposed by uh, the Congress. And we're still waiting for that, uh, so that uh, uh, in a way, uh, this could help our country to secure um, its 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 uh, sovereignty and protect the people basically. Chester, prior to the National Maritime Council EO, there was also the National Coast Watch Council, and before that, yeah. the Commission on Maritime and Ocean Affairs. Um, but. Uh, I, I don't think we hear a lot of those two councils in the past. Uh, what do you think right. would make this one uh, effective? I think uh, this one is uh, bigger in scope because it tries to harmonize um, all the other laws that we have. Remember, uh, our problem in the Philippines is that uh, we always tend to, 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 to crafting laws. Uh, that has been um, the... the solution uh, to many of our complex problems but uh, we didn't we didn't realize that um, implementation enforcement has always been our um, uh, problem also uh, in our country it's the reason why the um, uh, enactment of this new executive order is to harmonize all these um, executive orders that has been um, uh, that had been uh, uh, um, uh, established and crafted in the past. But uh, if you try to look at the EO57 now, it tries to uh, merge all of these uh, maritime laws related to coastal defense and to maritime security. So in a way, it tries, because of course, uh, we have to remember that when we talk about maritime security, it keeps on changing also. Mm -hmm. It just so happened that uh, in the coastal uh, watch and shadow um, statutes that we have, we were just focused on one area, which was the West Philippine Sea. But this time around, in the EO57, it entails uh, all the um, the uh, internal waters and the maritime domain around the uh, archipelago of the Philippines. Chester, um, one thing that was um, in that popped out to me uh, in mm. EO57 no, is itong uh, mga uh, allowing the council, the new council, to accept mm. donations, blah blah, etc. Mm. Um, Contribution, donations, donations, contributions, grants, bequests, or gifts mm -hmm. from both domestic and foreign sources. There you go. Um, Senator Amy Marcos has already voiced her concern about this. She called it a Trojan horse. What do you think? Oh, well, for me, this is in preparation for the upcoming trilateral uh, summit uh, in Washington. Remember that um, Japan has proposed for the uh, overseas security aid. This is the first uh, of its kind uh, where um, it just focuses on the uh, security and the national security infrastructures. Uh, remember, um, Japan has been offering us uh, the ODA or the official development uh, aid, which focus on the infrastructure and other uh, socioeconomic uh, developmental projects. But this time around, it's just focused on the security. And uh, we know for a fact that uh, Japan has been aggressive in uh, helping our Coast Guard. But um, if we try to look at it, um, the U.S. also has this in the Pacific Economic Framework where we try to uh, uh, help us in terms of our uh, security needs. So uh, I don't think that uh, this uh, negates uh, the, the um, uh, newly enacted and signed uh, executive order because ultimately uh, it helps us to widen uh, the network of the Philippines. Because if you try to look at it, um, the pendulum of uh, economics is also shifting. If you try to look at it, we are now in the stage uh, where uh, PPP or the public-private uh, private partnership um, is in the offing right now. And uh, 
uh, uh, Philippine Coast Guard is a civilian um, organization. It's not. Um, it's not. Uh, it's not part of the military. It's under the Department of Transportation. So basically, we need all the the, the mm. help and aid uh, for uh, aiding our resources right now. Because uh, for me, I think uh, we are lacking on those uh, kinds of infrastructures. Uh, there's no problem as long as it is written, it is transparent, and the public knows about it. And uh, remember that uh, part of the. Um, um, modernization program of the, the Philippines is uh, with the help of the private sector and, of course, with um, our allies and partners. So there's no problem about this. I think this is not uh, a Trojan horse or a Pandora's box that uh, we are seeing right now. I think this is just an expansion of what we are expecting from our but, friends uh, and allies just... uh, as long as there is no, there, uh, there, it is clear to the public that uh, this is for national right, security. Right, but just to uh, laymanize it for us, uh, that means we can now accept any amount of money in the name of bol bolstering maritime security? Is that what it means? Uh, not not really money, but uh, uh, aid, uh, kind of aid in the form are we of um, vessels or um, ma military material. Mm -hmm. uh, money uh, should uh, be... Uh, uh, it should not be equated to money. Mm, uh, okay. It can mm. be loans uh, and um, Equipment, uh, investment like packages. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do have to note, though, that I took a look at EO 57, the past one, mm. and there was this same provision. Mm -hmm. So it's not new. Okay. So it's, it's the same. So, but, so you can take grants, but not... I don't know. It's grants to me, or like yeah, grants, is, is uh, which I think um, uh, the Philippine Coast Guard has uh, benefited a lot, yeah, uh, particularly okay. with the help of Japan. Uh, okay. If you notice uh, in the uh, Coast Guard modernization, it uh, was Japan uh, that uh, truly helped uh, the Philippines uh, in terms of acquiring um, Coast Guard vessels. And um, up to now, there is, um, I, in my recent, because uh, I told you last time I'm writing a book, uh, uh, in my uh, research last time, um, JICA and um, definitely um, the, the Japanese government has been uh, offering um, the Philippines. Uh, this is not only uh, for uh, acquiring vessels, no? Um, it can also be packaged for training and um, other, um, of course, uh, equipment uh, that um, the, um, uh, the national security infrastructures and um, other organizations would be needing also. Okay, uh, we are going to have to leave that there for now. Um, lots for us to digest. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, that was security analyst Chester Cabalza. Well, up next, Cebu City declares a state of calamity in some barangays due to El Nino. We will be speaking.
Hospital and Tangtangan in South Cotabato. Well, another cause for concern are also the low water levels. Over in Angat Dam, water levels decreased to just a little over 190 meters yesterday due to the impact of the El Niño phenomenon and the dry season. The figure was 12.97 below Angat's normal high water level of 212 meters, though that's still above its minimum operating level. Over in Cebu City, dozens of mountain villages have been placed under a state of calamity due to El Niño. Data from the City Agriculture Department shows that 50% of production areas in upland barangays of Cebu City have soil cracks due to a lack of water. This has reportedly affected 506 farmers and 115 hectares of agricultural production areas. Let's try to get updates from the ground. Joining us from Cebu City, we have Mayor Michael Rama with us live via Zoom. Good evening, Mayor. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Good evening, good evening, uh, Sean, Gritchin, and uh, Regina. Good evening, Mayor. Magandang gabi, Bayan. Mayang gabi, Mayor. Mayor, can you give us a picture of what the situation is like in Cebu City as well as the mountain villages uh, amidst the dry season and El Nino? As being reported and brought as a concern that there really is a need uh, that I should be declaring crisis, especially on water availability. Uh, this is coupled also of the fact that until now, um, when we talk about our water district, is also facing an impasse. Thank God that LUA, the local water utilities, are now present in the city of Cebu to get into this matter of this local water district. Now, with this real concern as presented uh, it's not that it's the only time we learn about this but year uh, back especially month of march we were already seeing that a possibility of this uh, shall we say an alarming state now plus the fact that you can see on your picture that soil are cracking and really, some barangay is running out of water. And that's precisely the reason why we need to have a convergence being done on account of my declaration of crisis on water in the city of Cebu, not only upland, but likewise lowland, mm -hmm. um, Tres Marias. Um Mayor, um, yes, sir, be before we go into the future planning, what you plan to do with the calamity funds to address the water shortage, can we backtrack a bit to that impasse you mentioned with the LUWA, the local water <laughs> utility? Uh, ano po yung impasse yun and uh, how did that prevent Cebu from being able to plan for this El Nino, this dry season, which to be fair, the government has warned us about. Pagasa has been warning us about this. You are very right. You are very right. And uh, why, what is incumbent right now, uh, I don't want even to add up because uh, LOA is now taking charge mm -hmm. of what's going on in the Metro District uh, Management. And that matter about water uh, was also a part of the reason why such uh, a situation has to be faced upon by the city government. And we really did our part bringing the matter to LOA. And even I have made my own uh, um, set of new boards of the district. And this new board is coming out with a concern because that we cannot... Uh, <laughs> Mayor Rama? Uh, the responsibility of the problem ngayon, as it is being highlighted and nagiging uh, aggravated then, uh, because as mayor, I wish I could come in and fully exercise with my new board. 
Okay, so uh, your plan now, uh, the LGU plans to allocate up to 96 million pesos out of your 600 million peso quarterly funds to address this water crisis by El Nino. Um, can you tell us where this money is going to go, how you're going to dispatch this with the utmost haste I, in order to help your constituents? I, I have you with me, <laughs> but I do not want to be doing a litany mm -hmm. because we have a <laughs> short term, medium term, and long term. When you talk about a long term, this already had started even last year. Let's talk about uh, the short term since it's an emergency situation, Mayor. <laughs> and you're talking about the short term, uh, definitely it will include the information, education, communication. Number two, the short term is really the purchase of all this, uh, what we call uh, equipment or gadget that can easily would also be uh, converting what uh, or, or, uh, through osmosis that we can have a potable and even drinkable water. Then another thing would be immediate uh, um, supplies, especially fertilizers, etc., etc. Uh, there is an enumeration here, but I, as I said, we have this program, project, and activities that definitely. By tomorrow, there's going to be an executive uh, session. I will be attending uh, so that my city agriculture, including our uh, quick response team, plus our uh, um, DB map, because this will also include uh, animals and etc. So there are just too many things to be uh, uh, coming in, especially the concern of our farmers. Because definitely fertilizers, you can see all those things that are available. We have been distributing all of this as early as yesterday. Oh, yes, not yesterday, last year pa. Pero this whole thing of El Nino is being now forecasted that it can even last up to June or July. So we cannot just take things mat take matter for granted, but really to face the whole thing with much bigger and with much political will. So we are now going into this uh, coming out of, out of our 600 million that less than uh, eight or 90 million plus that we would like the council to approve. And actually, um, it's been reported, Mayor, that uh, we are expecting impact on at least 500 farmers and 100 and uh, 16 uh, hectares of farmlands. Is that accurate? And if so, what kind of an impact should we brace for in terms of short-term food output? Yeah, food, we may also have included here actually on matters about food security. Monitor and control the spread of victor burn diseases, that's livestock disease. Then there is also provision of farm supply materials, which we already have practically started last October 23, up to May. But I, if you're talking about May, we may have to extend it. Okay. Okay. Because that is now the forecast. We want Inca water drum tanks October last year, but to hang on May and, and program namin. Pero kailangan to nan and logistical support. It's million at Nalagay dito. Saka, you're talking about power sprayer, provision of farm supply materials, million rin dito. So actually, we are not uh, short of our program, project, and activities, but mm. we need to have it supported by logistical requirements. That we, we, we have money for this. Yeah. Just yeah. that no, we need mayor, to have mayor. the council to approve it. Yeah. I understand. I understand that there's plans. I understand there's uh, funding allocated yes. for it already. But what I'm interested in is young impacts of food production, uh, especially if we're talking yes. about 110 hectares of farmlands that might be affected. Oh, so, uh, anong classing impact po are we expecting from that if uh, there's no water there? Ano po yung mga produkto na apektado? You're talking about assuming, assuming because this will include now on social services. It is as if we're being hit by any typhoon or calamity for that matter, that we, we have been into this before, like Odette, mm -mm. like COVID, like uh, we, we 
We're looking at the point of how we respond all of this. And we, went, we have been doing very well, and we can do it. Actually, we've been very effective even until now. We're already free, and we're much up in our economy. But this is the thing that we have to be facing, and we've got to face this whole thing That's with boldness. That's why you have to declare crisis so that we can make purchases, respond as quick as possible without much red tape, without much hierarchy of requiring all this as COA would want us to do. But definitely we must be working it out to make this whole thing addressed as quick as possible. Well, here's uh, hoping that uh, the situation gets better and that uh, the local government has prepared enough uh, for the El Nino season. Maraming yeah. maraming salamat po. Uh, we, sa are, we have money, we have money. There's Yon. no problem Good news po money. yan, pag may pera. Oh, uh, yeah. sana matulungan po natin yung mga magsasaka natin. Uh, joining us from Cebu City, uh, we have uh, Mayor Michael Rama. All right, let's pause for a quick break for now. Right after that, though, President Bo last December, but the president extended his term until March 31st. President Marcos led the change of command ceremony and gave his marching orders. Police General Marvin, you have my full confidence and my full support as you begin to champion a police that is pro-God, pro-country, pro-people, pro-environment. Let us work closely with you. In, under, in addressing emerging threats such as cybercrime, terrorism, and transnational crimes. Mahusay, matatag, at maaasahan na kapulisan. This is our promise and commitment to our country as we undertake the internal and external changes necessary to improve our services to you. So who exactly is Major General Marbil? Well, he is a member of the Philippine Military Academy class of 1991 and has served as head of the Directorate for Comptrollership, managing the PNP's financial resources. He was also director of Police Regional Office 8 in Eastern Visayas and head of the PNP Highway Patrol Group. Marbil is 55 and is set to retire February of next year. Marbil's appointment came as a surprise for many, though. You may recall that just last week, Lieutenant General Emmanuel Peralta had been designated as PNP officer in charge. The designation was supposed to take effect March 31st, Easter Sunday, or until a replacement is appointed. Up until today, Peralta was expected to serve as PNP OIC for at least a few months 
And there has been no official word on the sudden switch. Bit of a revolving door, talaga. No? <laughs> it's like uh, Marbil, Major General Mar Marbil is basically in position for less than a year. Yes. Because February is when he He's hits turning to 56. 56, the retirement age. Uh, now, back on the issue of charter change, House leaders are calling out Pulse Asia over what they said is a misleading survey on Cha Cha. We have News 5 correspondent Marian Enriquez for the details on that. And what's this about? Reg, House leader said this Pulse Asia survey on charter change is essentially misleading and could even be a form of black propaganda against efforts to amend the Constitution. The Pulse Asia survey showed that only 8% of Filipinos are in favor of Cha Cha, while a whooping 88% are against it. The poll also took into account respondents' awareness of proposals to amend the charter, where most said they are aware. The survey also measured the respondents' knowledge of the Constitution, where in 75% said they had little to no knowledge. However, House leaders took offense over portions of the survey wherein respondents were asked about amendments to political provisions. House Majority Leader Manix Daripe asked why these questions were included when current efforts on Chacha only focus on economic amendments. Deputy Speaker J.J. Suarez adds that it may only confuse and mislead the public. Deputy Majority Leader Janet Garin also believes it could sway public opinion. Siyempre, kung yung mga Tanong mo ay related dun sa no election, um, term extension, uh, shifting from presidential to parliamentary form of government, shifting from a bicameral to a unicameral body. Natural kung ikaw yung respondent, magre-react ka. However, Pulse Asia stood by its survey saying they've been running the same questions for years. Ito mga katanungan na ito ay pagkatapos ng sa general question. Ang unang tanong muna ay kung sila ay bakpabol sa pagbabago ng konstitusyon. Mabuti siguro lang sukatin na natin yung pananaw ng publiko tungkol sa mga pagbabago ito. Kasi hindi natin matatanggal kung ito ay maaring ihayag ng ilan uh, individual. Kung hindi sa Kongreso ay sa mga darating na panoon. No? Reg, Congresswoman Garin went on to say that this only goes to show how much a publicity is needed to spark in-depth public discussions on charter change. But again, time is of the essence and we have yet to see significant progress over in the Senate to say if Chacha will indeed fly under the Marcus Jr. administration. Reg. You got that right. Time is of the essence. Thanks for that, man, Enriquez. We are going to pause for a quick moment right now, but right after that, the LTFRB has opened at Back. You are still watching the big story here in One News. Now, after the long Holy Week break, heavy jams have returned to the streets of Metro Manila, and commuters are again finding it difficult to catch a ride. The LTFRB solution additional 8,000 units of motorcycle taxis, even though the pilot study for their operations is already set to end in a month. The 8,000 total additional units will be divided among four motorcycle ride hailing firms that's Grab. Para Express, Maxim, and Ding Dong. 
This will be added to the current 51,000 motorcycle taxis operating in Metro Manila under Angkas, Joyride and Move It. Motorcycle taxi drivers, though, are not too happy with this move, saying this could affect their income. But the LTFRB assures them that this is their last expansion of motorcycle taxi operations in Metro Manila, with the pilot study set to end in May. Titigil ho kami sa pagbibigay ng accreditation for Metro Manila in deference po doon sa request ng transport sector na dumarami na raw po yung mga pampublikong sasakyan and then it now becomes uh, unviable now. Ang uh, sabi po ng Committee on Transportation, tatatlong transport groups lang yung, yung participant, hindi reflective ng study ng motorcycle taxi. There has to be more and it has to be in a lot of areas para talagang maging realistic, maging meaningful yung pilot study. Meanwhile, the LTFRB says it will soon allow motorcycle operations in the following areas, Pampanga, Iloilo, Bacolod, Davao, and Cagayan de Oro. Not sure though if that, you know, adding more supply will improve traffic situation. <laughs> That's um, what experts are unanimous about, right? That the that solution to traffic is not to add more vehicles mm -hmm. it's to on the road. It's to put an efficient public transport system. And public transport But, but I wonder what, what, what he means uh, when he says it's not enough to have three transport groups. I was we looking mean for at the, the pilot study, parang I oh. think what he means is for the pilot study, there are only three accredited groups. So parang to have a better pilot study, he wants like, more players in. That's the argument of the other group. But it's ending in May and we don't know at this point whether they're extending it, legalizing it finally, or what. I'm not it's sure it's all the You know, it has it been be going. A better study. It has been going on for so long now, yes. the pilot study, since before years COVID. Now, yeah. Years and years. So, um, I don't know if they're going to end diba, it. There's or... no clarity yet on what are they going to do with it after May. Do they yeah, legalize even if it? if you add more now, mm. and then hanggang May lang sila, how would that help the study also? In mm. terms of research, it also won't, right? So, uh, not much. Two I, months of extra data, mm -hmm. I guess. But again, in the meantime, mm. it's a lot more traffic on the road, right? We all know that that's what it's going to cost. 59,000 accredited motorcycle yeah. well, taxis. Brace yourselves. Ah. <laughs> Install like a beep alarms in your cars. The sensors. <laughs> toot, toot, toot. I have to figure out how to turn that on. But anyway, before we go, time for our big picture tonight. This one has to do with sports. The Philippines' world title drought in boxing has come to an end after Marvin Jerusalem defeated Japan's Yudai Shigeoka to bring home the WBC World Minimum Weight title. This is the second world championship for Jerusalem after briefly reigning as WBO Minimum Weight title holder last year. Earlier this afternoon, Jerusalem arrived back home to a hero's welcome. Prior to this title victory, Marlon Tapales was the last and lone Filipino world titleist. But he yielded his World Boxing Association and International Boxing Federation crowns to Naoya Inoue in their Super Bantamweight unification match last December. Well, we have another piece of news. Looks like we have another Olympic uh, athlete, Rose G. Ramos from weightlifting. Wow, um, has been qualified. But si Heidelin mukang. Uh, nandun pa, uh, hindi pa, magkalaban sure. sila ni Elrin Andoy. There, there sila yung mag magiging same weight class, di ba? Si Elrin Andoy Silang yun. Silang dalawa, oh, oh. ni Heidelin if ever. Yun. When Tas do we find out? Uh, it's supposed to be actually... Soon? By, yeah, Tonight? very soon. Because <laughs> the qualifiers are happening oh, now. Okay. Oh, okay. So, let's uh, wait for that. Hopefully... Hindi ko alam sa sabihin ko kasi pareho silang Pinoy, di ba? Oh. Parang nandun sila sa border noong top 10. Eh. Para sa akin, the more, oh. the many year. And Paris is already this year. Ang lapit na. What does that mean, border of top 10? They only take the 10 best ones. Parang ganoon. And then okay. I think uh, if, if to... I'm not uh, incorrect, Hyden is at 9th and then Elrin is at 10th or 10 and 11. But so oh, they're wow. just, you know, one spot thin margin lang. Very, very thin margin. Sa politics yun yung ano eh. 13th oh, senator. the magic 12. <laughs> the magic yeah. 12. So now, in, in this case, it's the magic 10. You have to make the cutoff, basically. Mm. Okay. Well, let's well, see what happens. Well, good luck. All the best to both ladies. Uh, <laughs> whatever the outcome is, we are proud that you're raising the flag for the Philippines, right? That's true. All right, that's it for the big story tonight. We'll, I guess, report on what happens tomorrow. It's back to work. Not like you know, it left us over the Holy <laughs> Week, right? We, we are one news, all sides, all the time. Thanks for tuning